Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. The family of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer killed by Alec Baldwin on the set of the film Rust, now suing Baldwin himself, alleging he violated 15 protocols when he fired that weapon at her. They've even recreated the incident with a video, which we will show you. And we have an exclusive interview with the Hutchins family attorney about that bombshell lawsuit coming up. But first, I'll admit it. This filing from special counsel John Durham has been difficult to parse. But now that we have more information and time to digest it, I think I finally understand the issues and allegations. Now, unlike the liberal media, I'm not going to ignore it. And unlike the right-leaning media, I'm not going to blow it out of proportion either. So to quickly recap, special counsel Durham has indicted a guy named Michael Sussman, an attorney who was representing the Clinton campaign charged for making a false claim to the FBI. It's alleged that when he tipped off the FBI about Donald Trump's possible ties to Russia back in 2016, he told the Bureau he was effectively acting as a good Samaritan when his firm was actually representing the Hillary Clinton campaign. Durham's filing, which became public this weekend, in connection with that case, alludes to a tech executive who goes unnamed by Durham, but it's cybersecurity expert Rodney Jaffe. And here's the key part of Durham's filing. It says, quote, Jaffe's employer had come to access and maintain dedicated servers for the executive office of the president, or EOP, as part of a sensitive arrangement whereby it provided DNS resolution services to the EOP. Jaffe and his associates exploited this arrangement by mining the DNS traffic and other data for the purpose of gathering derogatory information about Donald Trump. Now, if you didn't examine all the context, everything else that Durham said makes it seem like these people are hacking right into the presidency. But we care about the facts here. So let's take a minute to go through a timeline. February 2015, Jaffe hired that later indicted attorney Sussman, quote, in connection with a matter involving an agency of the U.S. government. OK, fast forward to 2016, and here's the key part. Jaffe is part of a small group of cybersecurity experts who are given access to massive swaths of Internet data. This is so they can monitor it for malware and other attempted security breaches. As part of this entirely legal monitoring, Jaffe says he discovered some unusual traffic between the Trump Organization and a Russian bank with ties to the Kremlin. He tells the attorney Sussman about it. Then a few months later, the DNC server gets hacked. Tens of thousands of private Democratic emails become public. Everyone's trying to get to the bottom of it, including Jaffe, whose company had a contract with the government. And so Jaffe and his company start digging deeper. In September, Michael Sussman tells FBI General Counsel James Baker what he says Jaffe's learned. The FBI investigated, ultimately decided it wasn't that. It was actually a marketing company who sent out email ads for Trump hotels and other clients. Now, it's important to remember that that was the meeting which led to Sussman being charged with making a false claim by allegedly not disclosing his law firm's connection to the DNC and the Clinton campaign. Sussman then has a meeting with the CIA to share what he knows from Jaffe. But look at the date. That's February 2017. That's after the election's over. Sussman gets indicted as a result of Durham's findings but he's not charged with a crime for that later meeting with the CIA. John Durham allowed the five-year statute of limitations to lapse there. A spokesperson for Rodney Jaffe delivered a pretty comprehensive response to what Durham laid out. He did this today, claiming he is apolitical and was legally contracted to have access to the data from the White House. Here's the quote. As a result of the hacks of EOP and DNC servers in 2015 and 2016, respectively, there were serious and legitimate national security concerns about Russian attempts to infil infil infiltrate the 2016 election. Upon identifying DNS queries from Russian-made phones in proximity to the Trump campaign and the EOP, respected cybersecurity researchers were concerned about the anomalies they found in the data and prepared a report of their findings, which was subsequently shared with the CIA. Jaffe has not been charged with any crime. But Durham is alleging he misused that access to gather negative information about Donald Trump. Jaffe's saying he was asked to investigate the Russian hack. Look, I take this allegation for the special counsel seriously. I devoted an entire segment to it on the show last night. I did two days of coverage on my, on my radio show. 
This matters. This matters enough to make sure we get it exactly right and not ignore it the way many in the liberal media have done or overhype it like many in the conservative media have done. Joining me now is Professor Ronald Seaver, a former federal prosecutor. He's a law professor at the Bush School of Government and Public Service at Texas A&M, who in 2016 also publicly called for Hillary Clinton to be indicted over the email scandal. Professor, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. So I had you on the radio show yesterday. Great to have you back. You've had another day to look at all of this. Tell me your big takeaway at this point. Well, the big takeaway is, and, it, and it's good to be here. Uh, look, I trust Durham. Uh, he's got a good reputation uh, as a non-political prosecutor. Uh, I can show my bias by telling you that I hope he pulls it all together. But at the same time, as a trial attorney and been a trial attorney for 25 to 30 years, I uh, can't say that I'm excited about the case that he has uh, displayed so far based on what we know publicly. Uh, I can hit three or four quick points, but one I feel a little uncomfortable about is the lead indictment on Sussman for uh, lying to uh, the FBI, basically to lying to James Baker, uh, saying that he wasn't representing any client. Uh, I don't know if Sussman said that in writing. I doubt it. I doubt it. he was tape recorded. Uh, basically, all we really know is that's kind of Sussman's word versus Baker. And then, of course, the thought is always, well, what was in Sussman's mind? I mean, was he, from his uh, uh, perspective, just being a uh, good Samaritan, saying, you know, yep. look, the Russians and Trump are coming, the Russians and Trump are coming, and I'm just telling you it's a good Samaritan, that I've got information that there's a problem. I mean, that's kind of the first thing that concerns me. Right. But there, I'm also concerned about the CIA representation. Well, uh, go ahead. I mean, I'll answer your question. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you because you, you've been yeah. talking about the concerns with the Sussman case, right? And that's the yeah. attorney uh, who's been indicted. Now yeah. I want to bring you to this allegation, these, these lines that are you know, pretty explosive in the, um, in the filing in connection with that case. Um, you know, how big a deal are they? How big a deal? I mean, it sounds, you and I talked about this on the radio when we were both sort of just gathering the information. When you just sort of read the one line, it sounds, you know, like they're hacking. And then you actually dig a little and you're like, wait a second, it's not really about hacking. How significant is that allegation from John Durham? Well, I think you kind of touched on it a little bit when you uh, went into Jaffe's statement. Uh, and when I read his statement where he said, yeah, you know, I had a client who gave me information who worked in the White House and uh, I was concerned about the data that was coming out, and I went ahead and uh, passed that on legally. I think he said legally. Uh, he did not say exactly in that statement, as I remember, as to who he passed it on to or why he felt it was legal, but I don't think he would have said that unless he felt he was backed up. Uh, the other aspect, too, about this hacking is the public needs to be aware, of course, that what they're talking about seems to be phone numbers and email addresses, not content of communications, which is a, a much greater infringement of privacy. One other point I want to make real quick and take your other questions is that when he, when Sussman went to the CIA and he said that these phones, they, they had found that, you know, the Trump organization or whoever was contacting these sort of secret Russian phones and, uh, you know, the, uh, it's been revealed that apparently that they weren't so secret and that was he was apparently lying to the FBI or misrepresenting to the FBI. Uh, again, in, in my question is, in Sussman's mind, did he think he was misrepresenting or did he think he was being honest? So even though right, I'm pulling, right. even though I'm pulling for Durham, I, I can't say <laughs> sitting back. That you I know, can't, can't say sitting back that it's a great case right now. Yeah. P Professor, one of the reasons that I was excited to have you on the show is because you're a straight shooter. One of the things I appreciate about you is you, like me, disclose your bias at the eye. You say, look, here's where I'm coming from. Here's what I'm thinking, et cetera. No, which allows the audience to judge yeah. what you're saying, I think, in a much more honest way. And I really appreciate that about you. You, ma you made a point a moment ago about the, the sort of the DNS. And I think we got to explain what that is. All right. So I asked my team to to make a sort of a, a thing we can put up on the screen. DNS logs 
are records of when computers or smartphones have prepared to communicate with servers over the internet. Essentially, it's like looking up a phone number. It's not private data. And I think that that, that is what he is alleging that this guy Jaffe used to try to find derogatory information about Trump. But how do you find derogatory information based on DNS logs? Well, <laughs> you're kind of asking the wrong guy on that. I am not a technical <laughs> computer person. So, uh, and like you, I'd have to go, I'd have to go in my office to the Fair people enough. for word. But I want to emphasize that Joffe's statement said that, uh, uh, again, he, uh, the data that concerned them as a tech guy, uh, he legally passed off. So where exactly, why does he say that? Who did he give it to? Why does he think it was legal? Right. And do you agree with me that the right-leaning media has overhyped this and the liberal media has um, improperly ignored it? Well, man, boy, you probably shouldn't start me off on the media. But the thing is that, uh, yeah, I think the, the right-leaning media is hoping for something uh, there. Uh, but the left-wing media, as they have done in so many things from the Hunter Biden to the uh, Russia collusion hoax uh, are kind of inexcusable as well. But the right-leaning media is hoping, they're hoping that it's there and that it's, uh, uh, it'll come out. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I agree with you on that. The, the media is, uh, unfortunately our media in the country, unlike when I was younger, uh, doesn't always report the news, but really uh, is extremely biased in the reporting from both ends. I agree. That's why we're trying to do what we do on this show, which is we try and play it straight. And we have straight shooters like you on as guests. Professor Ronald Siever, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Great to be here. Coming up later in the show, we'll show you some of the reckless media coverage of this story. Also coming up, the family of Helena Hutchins, the cinematographer killed by Alec Baldwin on the set of Rust, is officially suing Baldwin and the movie's producers making some very serious allegations about what they say was Baldwin's reckless behavior, including presenting a dramatic video reenactment. The family attorney joins us for an exclusive interview coming up. Lawyers for the family of Helena Hutchins, a cinematographer fatally shot on the Rust set, have filed a bombshell lawsuit against Alec Baldwin and others involved on the movie set. To be clear, they're not just suing the producers, including Alec Baldwin, but they point the finger of blame squarely at Alec Baldwin, claiming he violated 15 specific safety protocols, including the use of a real gun instead of a dummy weapon, use of live ammunition on set, improper storage. The lawsuit suggests that Baldwin may have even committed a crime, reckless discharge of a deadly weapon, criminal offense in New Mexico. During a press conference today, they released a video that they created reenacting the October 21st shooting. The nearly 10 minute video includes this moment of the fatal shooting. The video uses computer generated figures of Baldwin and others on the set. The video also uses Baldwin's own comments against him. I take the gun and I start to cock the gun. I'm not going to pull the trigger. I, I said, do you see that? She goes, well, just cheat it down and tilt it down a little bit like that. And I cock the gun. I go, can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see that? And she says, and then I let go of the hammer of the gun and the gun goes off. Baldwin's attorneys just released this statement in response, which says in part, any claim that Alec was reckless is entirely false. He, Helena, and the rest of the crew relied on the statement by the two professionals responsible for checking the gun that it was a cold gun, meaning there's no possibility of a discharge, blank or otherwise. This protocol has worked on thousands of films with millions of discharges, as there has never before been an incident on a set where an actual bullet harmed anyone. Actors should be able to rely on armorers and prop department professionals, as well as assistant directors, rather than deciding on their own when a gun is safe to use. Joining us now is attorney for the Hutchins family, Brian Panish. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. So what do you make of uh, 
Alec Baldwin's attorney's response. Well, first of all, Dan, it's great to be here. Second, uh, Alec Baldwin is continuing to do what he's done throughout this. He's blaming others. He's not accepting any responsibility. He lays off fault on others when, in fact, but for him shooting the gun, Helena is still here today. You know, you go squarely at Alec Baldwin in this lawsuit. You know, he said the gun just went off by accident. It, it wasn't his fault. What are the areas where you think it was, quote unquote, his fault? Well, first of all, he refused any gun safety training, number one. Number two, he pointed a gun at someone on a set. You don't do that without plexiglass and other precautions. Number three, why were there bullets in the gun to, be, to begin with, whether they be fake or real? It was only a lineup. There was no intention for him to shoot the weapon. He wasn't supposed to shoot the weapon. Nobody expected him to do that, yet he recklessly fired the weapon while pointed at three people, killed one and injured another. That is reckless, Dan. It doesn't happen on movie sets when people follow rules, but his lawyer was wrong. Brandon Lee was killed on a movie set by a bullet. And so Baldwin, again, is in complete denial, accepting no responsibility. And we look forward to letting the, the folks, the community in Santa Fe County determine his responsibility. Do you think he should be charged with a crime? We, Dan, I'm not the prosecuting attorney. We're told them we will fully cooperate, and it's up to them. But there is laws in New Mexico that would support it, but they're independent. We're not getting involved in that decision. Either way, we intend to prove our case that Mr. Baldwin and others acted recklessly and caused a death that was senseless, that never needed to happen. And it's a tragedy, and it was caused by the cost-cutting and lack of safety measures undertaken by Mr. Baldwin and others. Has Helena's family changed its views on Alec Baldwin since they were together in the days after the shooting? No, in fact, their, their views were never uh, one way or the other. Mr. Hutchins, Matthew, met with Mr. Baldwin several times. He's been very cordial with Mr. Baldwin, but he's just trying to find out what happened. He's not taken a position with Mr. Baldwin. He just takes the information in and assesses it himself. Would your clients settle this case or are they determined to take it to trial? Well, you know, Dan, most cases settle. We certainly are willing always to discuss it, but we're looking for answers. And until we have answers and we use the court process to subpoena witnesses and documents to find out what really happened, and Mr. Hutchins and others want to know why did this happen what was the cause of this? We think we know. We've done a thorough investigation, Dan. We spent months going to the scene, interviewing witnesses that were there before and after, obtaining documents, hiring expert witnesses. We take this very seriously. We seriously invested the case, investigated it before making these, these contentions in a lawsuit that we can support with facts and evidence. You know, as a legal matter, the defendants are going to claim this case should be dismissed because this was a workplace incident and thus should go through the state's uh, worker compensation system. What do you make of that? Well, first of all, Helena uh, was an independent contractor. She was not employed by them. She had never worked for them before. She brought her own tools and, and skill to the job, and she was an independent contractor. So it wouldn't be barred by workers' comp. And additionally, in New Mexico, if you were able to show reckless conduct on behalf of the employer, that case proceeds. So I would invite their lawyer to look at the law in the state of New Mexico. Uh, bottom line, the, the family is now, is it fair to say, pointing the finger of blame squarely at Alec Baldwin? Definitely pointing the finger at Alec Baldwin and others who were responsible for safety on the job site and cost cutting. It's not that this just happened as a fluke. There was a number of steps and, and policies that had to be violated for this to happen. And it was clearly reckless. And we're going to prove that. Brian Panish, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you much, Dan. Coming up, as we showed you earlier in the show, Special Prosecutor John Durham's filing alleges misuse of data to hurt Donald Trump, and it is super complicated and requires nuance, which is something that both sides of the cable news spectrum are not good at. I'll show you how bad, coming up next. 
Time now for our Media Moments. We check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. Those of you who saw the earlier segment know that I've taken the filing from Special Prosecutor John Durham seriously, in which he accused a tech executive who had a tie to a Clinton campaign attorney of mining certain types of Internet traffic, quote, for the purpose of gathering derogatory information about Donald Trump. Serious allegation. I've been covering it for days. But as we showed you earlier on the show, there was no alleged hacking or infiltration. The exec had a contract to examine government data. But Durham is alleging he misused that access. Fair enough. The exec denies it, presents an explanation of what he did and why he did it. It's complicated technical stuff. And no one's been charged with a crime for it. Still unclear because it was a passing reference in a filing about something else. You know, cable news on both sides tend to be very bad at nuance. And in this case, the chief violator has been Fox News, who simply portrayed it as a major spying bombshell. How are they being covered? Martha, it's absolutely stunning that virtually all the major newspapers and the other networks uh, are absolutely determined to ignore this story. Yes, zero coverage. Media stayed silent on this. Nearly all of the mainstream media, surprise, surprise, isn't reporting about any of it. It's a media blackout. They're not reporting it. America needs to know. This needs to be exposed. It is a huge story. Imagine if Donald Trump had done this to All right, so that's not the piece of sound uh, we wanted to use. Um, so, but they're right about the fact that the media isn't covering it. Um, do we have the other piece of sound that we were looking to play right there? No. Okay. All right. You know what? Let's, uh, let's take a break. We will come back <laughs> with, uh, with more in a moment. We've got Robert Shapiro, the famed attorney, coming up to talk to us about the Prince Andrew agreeing to settle the sex abuse case brought by Jeffrey Epstein's accuser. Says he's not admitting any guilt or responsibility. He is, however, also going to donate to victims' rights groups. Come on, who settles for likely millions of dollars when they did absolutely nothing wrong? Do we have Robert Shapiro there? I just want to see the guy. Come on. No? All right, he's coming up next. To try to answer that question. The Duke of York has caved and decided to settle with a woman who accused him of sexually abusing her when she was a teen. Britain's Prince Andrew was weeks away from having to give a deposition in the federal lawsuit filed against him by Virginia Dufre. Just last month, a judge had allowed the case to move forward into the discovery phase. In paperwork filed today, attorneys for both sides say they've reached a confidential settlement to end the litigation. They're not disclosing how much money Andrew will be paying out, but you can bet this is big dollars. I'd presume at least low to mid seven figures, if not eight figures. But of course, Prince Andrew continues to steadfastly deny her allegations and has made no admission of guilt or responsibility in the settlement announcement. He's just going to pay huge bucks to make it go away, which I, I find to be a bizarre concept. He did nothing wrong. What she says is totally false. But you know, you agree to pay millions for something totally made up. Sure, the agreement means the royal family can now avoid the airing of any potential dirty laundry. Jeffrey claimed that Jeffrey Epstein and his associate, Ghislaine Maxwell, trafficked her to Prince Andrew for sex three times two decades ago when Jeffrey was 17 and the prince was 41. In an unsigned letter attached to today's court filing, Andrew blames it all on Epstein and tries to portray himself as a, as a great philanthropist and promises a, quote, substantial donation to Miss Jeffrey's charity in support of victims' rights. Goes on. It's known that Jeffrey Epstein trafficked countless young girls over many years. Prince Andrew regrets his association with Epstein and commends the bravery of Miss Jufre and other survivors in standing up for themselves and others. They have obviously come a long way in just a few months when Andrew's attorneys were attacking Jufre, saying she was simply out to make a buck by launching a public smear campaign against him and by extension the royal family. So I know that asking a common sense question in the context of Complex legal battles may seem insane, but how do you view this as anything but an admission of guilt? Joining me now is the ultimate person to help us answer this. The man so many high profile clients turn to when they are in trouble, my old friend and attorney, Robert Shapiro. He has represented everyone from OJ Simpson, where we met back in the day, to major sports and entertainment stars. Robert, it is great to see you. Thanks for coming on the show. Hey, Dan, you dragged me out of the gym to just to be with you. So it's great to uh, talk to you tonight. I hope all is well with you. 
you're looking particularly fit as you come out of the gym. Um, take us, all right, so, so let me ask you about this, all right? So I, I know that people ask this all the time, right? And I know that you're probably asked this in, you know, dinners or cocktail parties. It is very hard to accept the notion that you settle for huge amounts of money and also claim, but I did nothing wrong. How, does, how do you reconcile that as an attorney? <clears throat> Very simply, Dan, I, I get these cases on a regular basis, and the overwhelming majority settle. Uh, most of them in California are, are different because once a lawsuit is filed, you cannot have a confidential settlement. So the law in federal court in New York is different. Uh, but, it, but it's pretty simple. It's a risk-reward type of situation. Uh, you're dealing with a civil case. The burden of proof is simply which side do you believe just a slightly more? Uh, it's the balancing of the scales of justice with a feather on one side. And, and the way I explain it to clients is very simple. A bad settlement is better than an adverse verdict. Uh, in these cases, you're dealing with punitive damages. That, that can be extraordinary. And uh, trials are, are, are very, very difficult for everybody involved. Mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with a case 20 years old. How, how do you defend a case 20 years old? Uh, a young woman gets up and makes a claim. Uh, a, a person accused says it didn't happen. And the, the jury is, is left to make a decision. Which side do they believe more? But I, I guess I'm viewing this. You, you've given us a, a very persuasive legal explanation. I, I guess what I'm asking is when the client comes to you and, and the client literally insists to you, this is entirely made up, right? There's no nuance. There's no misunderstanding. There's, there's no possibility. I'm telling you, this never, ever, ever happened. I've got to believe that if a client comes to you and says that, you're going to have a much harder time advising that client to settle for multi-millions of dollars, no? You know, uh, I've got a case pending right now. It's uh, over 20 years old. Same type of allegation, a very uh, well-known person. Uh, and, you know, we're talking about whether we should settle or not. We went to a mediation, and uh, I can't use the exact words that the mediator used who is a highly experienced but basically it was s happens and so there's always a risk and you need to minimize risk when you're talking about uh these types of cases so let me uh, just a little list here of some celebrities who've settled without admitting any guilt michael jackson 25 million bill cosby 3.4 james franco 2.2 r kelly 1.5 Commander's football team, 1.6. Cristiano Ronaldo, 375. I've been criticized a lot in the past for talking about Michael Jackson, by defenders of Michael Jackson, uh, for talking about the amount he paid out in a settlement, and whether it was 20 or 25 million, whatever the exact amount uh, was of that settlement. But it seems to me it's fair game that when you settle for that kind of money, the notion that you can, in one hand, say, I settled because I needed to end it. And then on the other hand, say, but I did absolutely nothing wrong. It's just, it's tough for people to swallow. I, I agree with you. I, I agree with you. I mean, it's, it's similar to taking the Fifth Amendment uh, in yeah. a criminal case. Uh, there's an assumption that you're guilty. Uh, why would people settle? You're making uh, the exact arguments that people make all the time. But realistically, uh, we're, we're dealing in, in an area where we are dealing with a great unknown. Uh, a person could absolutely be convinced that none of this happened, but the jury may not believe them. And then they're liable for punitive damages on top of uh, general damages. So, you know, I, I don't think you can make judgments like this. When, when people agree to make a confidential settlement, with an acknowledgement that nothing took place, then that's the way the public should view it. And um, Prince Andrew, in the settlement court filing, 
this is number three, says the following. He pledges to demonstrate his regret for his association with Epstein by supporting the fight against the evils of sex trafficking and by supporting its victims. Again, I understand why his lawyers have said we got to put that in there. And I think you could probably also understand why people are going to see that considering what this case is about and knowing that he's paying off big bucks, that that seems kind of disingenuous, right? You, you, you know, look, uh, people are going to draw whatever conclusions they want to draw. The bottom line is that both parties decided it was in their best interest to settle. I'm sure yeah. on the plaintiff's side, they, they were told you're going to get much more money if you go to trial. But there's a chance you may not prevail. So you have to look at it, Dan, from both people's points of view. It, it's just not a one-sided yeah. settlement. I got to ask a final question. Uh, when you were at the gym, were you wearing the BS Bob Shapiro hat? That you, that you, that <laughs> it's not BS. It's actually R. It, a lot of people would say BS. It's oh. actually RS. Uh, oh, it says you know, RS. I've been boxing right, for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've been boxing for a long time, as you probably know. So uh, I just took a little break. I'm going to go back into it. And uh, yeah, I keep the hat on until I All just right. get into the ring. Don't mess with Bob Shapiro. Remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Great to see you, Bob. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Dan. Stay healthy, stay safe. Thanks again. All right. Coming up, a convicted killer jumps a fence and finds his way to freedom. He was injured in his escape. Should have been short-lived, but get this. He then fooled authorities into getting him an ambulance to the hospital. He was treated for his wounds. And he went for treatment not once, but twice. Oh, and did I mention that this was the murderer's second successful escape from prison? That's next. A Mississippi inmate convicted of killing two people, a murderer, not only escaped state prison once, but twice, and then somehow tricked police into helping him to get a ride to a hospital for treatment. It's a story that's almost too wild to be a movie script. Michael Floyd Wilson, a.k.a. Pretty Boy Floyd, was sentenced to two life sentences for murdering two men in 2014. He escaped soon after and was given another life sentence for that. On Saturday morning, he escaped again. The 51-year-old managed to cut loose from the Central Mississippi Correctional Facility he climbed over this 12-foot fence topped with two feet of razor wire. Wilson suffered cuts to his hands and arms and managed to get treatment twice from an area hospital. One of those hospital visits, police helped him get a ride. Yep, police were called about a man bleeding at an auto parts store who wouldn't leave. Wilson lied to officers saying he'd been in a car accident. So the officers called an ambulance to drive him to the hospital. In 2018, he fled a different Mississippi prison, was able to avoid being captured for two days before a tip led to his arrest back then. We know what this guy is capable of, and we didn't know how desperate he was. He didn't have anything to lose, so uh, we're very happy to get him off the street and get him back in jail. And this morning, that sergeant's nightmare seemed like a reality. Wilson was nowhere to be found. But then this afternoon, a break in the case. He was captured. Officials described how it went down kind of an interesting way that he was captured. He uh, was riding in a car with a lady that had picked him up to give him a ride and she realized he was probably going to hijack her car because he kept looking at the gas gauge. And so finally, he, uh, when she realized that, well, then they had a little bit of altercation, not very much in the car, but anyway, took the car away from her. And so she goes running down the road and finds a ride and gets them to tell the police. And so then they find the car and start to pursue the car and then he starts to speed up and just when he starts to speed the car up so he can run away from the police he runs out of gas so he goes over to the side caught and captured with no event really wow meanwhile the mississippi department of corrections has launched an investigation and released this statement saying in part we are placing several employees on administrative leave pending disciplinary action including management as the investigation continues Joining us now, journalists covering the story extensively, Byron Brown, an anchor for Next Star Station WJTV in Jackson, Mississippi. Thanks so much for coming on the program. Appreciate it. All right. So tell me what we know 
about the night he escaped uh, this time, particularly because how did this happen, you would think, considering that they knew he's a flight risk? Well, he escaped Saturday morning around 6.30 that morning. And the, the big issue, they said, is that his status had changed from uh, maximum security to minimum security. And that was the big issue that they're having this investigation with 12 employees that we now know are under disciplinary action here who have been suspended. So it happened Saturday morning at 6.30. And then he got out of the prison, as you mentioned, across that 12-foot uh, uh, fence and barbed wire and went to a subdivision nearby I went to that subdivision and asked for help, claimed that he was an FBI agent, had a motorcycle accident. Uh, they called for an ambulance and took him to the University Medical Center. He was there until about 3 o'clock that afternoon. They discharged him from the hospital. Somehow he managed to get to another city, which is about 30 minutes from the city of Jackson. We don't know how he got there. Uh, they went to the Walmart first and then went to the auto parts store. He was continuing. He was bleeding there. They called the police at that time. He told another story changed his name and said he had been into a car accident. They called for an ambulance and he then he got back to the same hospital. They kept him there until about four o'clock in the morning. He was then discharged from the hospital at four o'clock Sunday morning. Then he was, saw, he was seen on the streets of Jackson uh, by U.S. Marshals. Uh, they spotted him, but no one approached him at that time. From what do we understand? It wasn't until 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday that the public and law enforcement found out that he was an escaped inmate. So it was more than 24 hours before anyone knew that they had an escape from the prison. So that's where the problem was. Now, the commissioner is saying that uh, because of that, uh, there was a problem with folks not following procedure. Because it was asked, do you need to change your procedure? And he said, no, it's not changing procedures. It's that they didn't follow procedures. And so it was on them that this problem happened. And so that's why we have 12 employees now uh, facing some serious, he said, severe uh, disciplinary actions. Yeah, because it sounds like there was a, a number of problems here. I mean, you know, ranging from the fact that he was in minimum instead of maximum, and then the delay in time didn't alert people. I felt bad for the officers. We we're just trying to help the guy. And uh, they end up... Uh, getting this guy to a hospital. Byron Brown from Next Star Station WJTV in Jackson, Mississippi. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Dan. Coming up, a son accused of shooting and pistol whipping his dad. And when police show up, he's not done. Turns the gun on officers. The scary shootout caught on police body cam is up next. Sean Lark. We are on scene with the Orange County, Florida Sheriff's Department showing the dangers that law enforcement face every day. Deputies were called to a home northwest of Orlando for a family dispute. The suspect, Kadeem Smith III, had pulled a gun on his father. Hey! Drop the gun! Shots fired! Deputies heard gunshots and a woman screaming as they arrived on scene. Smith shot his father in the arm and pistol whipped him, then targeted the deputies. They called for backup and took cover behind parked cars. Yeah, we're in a gunfight. Signal 43. One down in the road. He's still shooting at us. Hey, all right, hold on, hold on. Hands up! Put your hands up! Deputies returned fire, hitting Smith. He kept firing. His backup arrived. I've got a shot. Drop the gun. Shoot him. He's still aiming at us. Suspect died in the shootout. His father suffered non-life-threatening injuries. No deputies were hurt. The, the incident is under investigation. Joining me now, as always, Sean Sticks Larkin, retired Tulsa police lieutenant. All right, uh, Sticks, this is an intense uh, scene there. Again, as always, take me through this from the police perspective arriving on that scene. Yeah, you know, Dan, people frequently ask, why do police officers park so far away from a house? We usually try to stop one or two houses away because it gives us that distance. It allows us to basically evaluate what we're going to walk into, um, you know, from a point of safety. And you actually see the deputies do this. They're stopping a, you know, a house or two away, and they encounter the suspect out in the road um, and witness him shoot his own father. 
Now, that is obviously a rarity. Typically on domestic violence calls, we show up after that initial violence has happened and then deal with it from there. So it is very rare for, you know, for us to be present and witness the shooting happen and then get to the gun battle, just as we see here. And, and, and here they have a situation where they both have to help the father, right, who's obviously alive and, and uh, survived, at the same time as subduing the suspect. Yeah, and you know, and, you know, we see this gun battle actually go on here for you know whether, whether it's 90 seconds or two minutes from several different officers with pistols, and then the final shot that's fired, which we see there by a shotgun. Uh, not only do they have to help the father, they have to be aware that he's in their backdrop while they're firing, trying to stop this suspect. Now, the good thing about this is the suspect, once the deputies arrive, he is focused on the deputies, and that violence is no longer directly. I'm sorry, directed towards his own dad. So the deputies take cover. They return fire as they call for backup. Let's play that again. Yeah, we're in a gunfight. Signal 43. Got one down in the road. He's still shooting at us. Drop, drop, drop. Suspect's on the ground, but he's still pointing a weapon at them. Yeah, correct. You see the officers actually retreat, you know, from their police cars pretty, pretty quickly. And as you can see there in the yard, both of the officers we see, the one with the shotgun and the other one up there to the right, they position themselves behind wheel wells, behind engine blocks and things like that for ballistic cover. The suspect is down because he's been shot, but he's still holding that gun. And you hear them over and over and over in him, I'm sorry, over and over and over again, giving him an opportunity to separate himself from that gun. Obviously, he does, he does not. He continues to fire at deputies. Uh, and then you see the final shot fired with that shotgun there. A reminder again, as we've talked about so many times, about how dangerous domestic calls can be. Yeah, very much so. It's a complete unknown. Domestic violence calls and car stops, those are the two things you just don't know what are going to happen when you go to them. Most other calls, you have a, you know, a typical idea, a car accident, a burglary report, something like that. These two uh, you know, type of deals, you just never know what's going to happen. Sean Larkin, as always, thank you. Good to see you. You as well, Dan. Thank you. That does it for us tonight. News Nation Prime with Marnie Hughes starts in five seconds. Thank you for watching. Click the red subscribe button below so you can get more of News Nation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.